Hi, and welcome to Code Tutorials. In this video, we'll be taking a look at the Interactive Links block, which is part of our key blocks for Gutenberg Premium plugin. The Interactive Links block allows you to create a set of links that will have hover effects and an image that will be displayed for each link when it's hovered over. The page we're on has several examples of this block's use to help you get an idea of what you can do with it and how you can style and integrate it on your pages, such as creating whole sections where this element is allowed to shine. This block comes with a multitude of options for setting the layout, customizing the content, and styling the text and images. You'll be spoiled for choice with the interactive links block. With that said, let's take a look at what those options are exactly. Head over to the back end. You'll need a page to work in. Once you have that, you can start adding blocks. And blocks can be added in one of two ways. The first is by clicking on this blue button here. It will open the block selection. You'll see all the blocks your site has. That includes everything you get with Gutenberg itself, as well as the key blocks collection, and anything else you may have added. You can easily tell the key blocks apart by their red icons. To start with, you'll see the premium blocks, and then you'll see the free ones. Now, you can browse through this selection to find your block, then drag and drop it on the page. However, you can also insert a block from within the page. Let me close this. Within the page, click on this plus sign button. This will open the block selection where you have a search function. Simply start typing the name of the block you want, and when it appears below, just click on it to add. There, and this is what the interactive links block looks like when it's just been added to the page. We have two items, or links, each with a title, a subtitle, and a dummy image. To customize this block, we'll start from the content tab. And the first option here is for picking the layout. The default is standard, and we can see what that looks like on the left. But we also have background, where the image will appear as the block's background. And when you hover, the appropriate image for each link will appear. However, as I still have the dummy images, which are identical, we can't see the change. Still, you get the idea. Moving on to the rest of the layout settings. There is inline, which puts the images at the outermost edges of the block space. And finally, we have split, which has the images on one side and text on the other. This is the layout I plan to use for my version of interactive links. So, with my layout selected, I can proceed to the items. Each item is a different link, and when you click on one, it unfolds to reveal additional options. There are a couple of fields here, for the link, the title, the text, and the image. And if we open the second item, we can see it has all those same fields with the same dummy content. I'll delete the second item so we can properly focus on the first one. Don't worry, I'll be creating more items later on, this is just for now. So, let's get back to our options for the item. The link field allows us to enter a URL that will link the item's text content to any page you like. Since this is just a tutorial, I'll set a hashtag as a placeholder that will make the text behave as if it's been linked. Then, in the title field, I'll set my content instead of the placeholder. There. Next. In the text field, I'll replace the dummy content with my own. And there. After that, we have the image field where we can upload a new image. Give me a moment to find the one I want. There. And select. And there it is on the page. However, its display is cut off. That's because we have this option, stretch image, that's enabled by default. It expands the image to fill the entire space left over to the image content. Even if the image is stretched, it maintains its ratio. That's why my image was cut off. It was wider than it was tall, so it ended up cropped to fit the width and height of the image space within the block. I'm going to switch this off to get the image displayed in its entirety without being trimmed to fit. Okay, with this we covered all the item options. I'm going to make a few more items now, so I'll have several interactive links at the end. But as we've seen how the steps for that go, I'll skip ahead with the video. And here we are. I'm done making my links, and now we can see how the block behaves and the images change when I hover over the different link items. 
And with that done, we can continue going through the options from where we left off. So, we saw stretch image, which brings us to the hide images option. This allows us to set below which screen width we want the images to stop appearing. This is done mostly for smaller screens such as mobile phones and tablets, where the images might interfere with users having a clear view of the information and being able to interact with it comfortably. I'm going to set below 680 pixels for my block. That's broadly the width of the portrait orientation on tablets. OK. Underneath this is the advanced section, which contains the additional CSS classes option. This is where you can create a specific class for this element, and then you can use that class and refer to it when creating CSS that would style your interactive links block. OK, that's all for this tab. Moving on to the Style tab. Within it, we have three sub-tabs, Content, Title, and Text. We'll start with the first one, Content. It has options for styling some general aspects of the interactive links. For example, we can use the Enable Full Height option to stretch the element out so its height matches that of the screen. If I do that for my block, the difference isn't particularly noticeable as I don't have a background color that would differentiate the block from the rest of the page. I'll return the setting to No. After that, we have the List Padding option. With it, we can adjust the space around the list with the links. Before I show you that, I want to look at a different option. The list position. It determines whether the list with the links will be to the left of the images or the right. By default, it's on the left, as we can see, but we can set it to be on the right. I want to keep mine on the right. And now that I've set that, I can go back and adjust the padding around the list. Now, this option comes with four input fields, so we can set a different amount of padding for each side of the link list, and we have some padding set by default. But if I, for example, set 50 pixels for the top padding, that will reduce the amount of space. And in doing this, I also affected the space at the side for the image. However, I don't want to do that. So I'll leave all the fields for the outside areas blank, and I'll use only the left padding to set 130 pixels. As you can see, this value helps us adjust the space between the links list and the images that go with it. Whether you increase or decrease that space is up to you. After that, we have the list width option. With it, we can set the width of the space given over to the list with the links. Let me demonstrate. If I set 300 pixels here, the list becomes narrower and the image gets to take over more space. I don't want my text content breaking into multiple lines like this, so I'll clear the value and reset the option to get a default value for the width back. Next, we have the Space Between Items option. This will allow us to create more space between the different links in the list. I do want to spread them out a bit, so I'll enter a new value here. And that value will be using the viewport width as the unit of measurement. So 2.15 and there. Now we can see that there's more space between the links in the list. OK, that brings us to the List Position option, which we've already looked at. So, let's move on to the next sub-tab, Title. Among the options here, we have the title color, so we can change the color of the title text and its accompanying underline. You can change the color by dragging the slider to select a new color, or by making this field editable and entering a specific code for the color you want, using the hex, RGB, or HSL system. Then, whichever color you set will appear over the title. I'm happy keeping the default, so I'll simply reset the color selection. OK. Under that, we have the title hover color. With this option, we can change the color of a link that someone hovers over. Without someone hovering, this changes the color of the first link in the list. So we can see only the title for the topmost link has changed. But when we hover over one of the others, the color will move to follow our actions. I'll reset the option as I plan on using the default color setting. After this, we have the title typography settings. When I open them, you can see that they include several different options for adjusting the title text. So, we can change the font family for the titles in the list. If I set a new one, give me a sec to find it. This is it, okay. Other than the font family, we can change the font size here. 
I'm going to set 73 pixels for that. Perfect. Next, there is the font weight option, where we can select if we want our text to be normal, light, bold, or anything in between. I'm going to keep mine set to the default. Next, we have the transform option, which lets us change the text to uppercase, lowercase, make it capitalized, or leave it normal, the way we typed it in. Then there's the style option for making the text normal or turning it italic or oblique. Following that, the decoration option will let us add a line under, over, or through the text. Finally, we have two options for spacing adjustments, the line height and letter spacing. Okay, those are all the options you get under typography. After them, we have the title hover style option. This lets us pick what kind of line will appear with the length title when we hover over it. By default, it's set to underline, but we can replace it with line through. Then we'll get this look. I plan to stick with the underline for my design, so I'll select it again. There. Then, after that, we can adjust the thickness of that underline. So if I move the slider, we can see the line getting thicker. You don't have to make it this bold, I only did this to show you. In fact, I'll clear this now as I plan to use the default value for the underlying thickness. And then we have the hover line offset option, which can help us move the underlying closer to the title or further away from it. Let me demonstrate. As you can see, the adjustments here need more of a delicate touch. But to sum up, moving the offset value towards the negative will draw the line away from the title, while pushing it towards the positive will place the line closer to the title. I want the two to be closer, so I'll put 10 pixels here. And there we go. Also, that covers the last of the options within the title sub-tab, so we can move on to the text sub-tab. The options here will apply to the smaller descriptive text under the title. The first option we have for it is to change its color. You have this familiar color picker, so it's easy to choose whatever you like. We also have the text hover color option. If we want to differentiate the text for the topmost list item or for one that we hover over, I'll reset this. Under those, we have the text typography selection of options. If we take a look at it, we can see it contains all the same options we've covered under the title typography, so there is no need to go over them again. Of course, if there is anything you want to change about your text size, font, style, or more, you can do so here but I will be sticking with the default look, so I'll just close this. And after the typography, we have one more option, the text margin top. It allows us to add more space above the text, so if I set 30 pixels as an example, we can see there's more space here and that by adjusting the text margin top, I actually separated the title and text. This gap here is too much for me, so I'll half it and put 15 pixels as the value. There. Perfect. That wraps up all the options within the three sub-tabs that together make up the Style Options tab. This brings us to the last tab, Advanced. The options here are something you get with every one of the key blocks for Gutenberg, and they serve to set how an individual block will look and act on the page. For example, there are responsiveness and motion effect settings here. While these options are undoubtedly useful as they can help you adjust block positioning, background, border, and more, they affect blocks as a whole. They aren't specific to this particular block, so we won't be covering them in this tutorial. And that brings us to the end of this video. My interactive links element is done. I have my content, the images and the four link items in the list, and they all have the style, both regular and on hover, that I wanted. Since I'm done, I'll hit update to save my work. Now that you've seen all the options this block offers, you can take another look at the page we started from and examine the design solutions offered there. These examples are easy to break down now that you know how the interactive links block works, so you can easily copy them for your own site. Or you can take them as a starting point for your own custom design solution. Whatever you opt to do, we hope you found this tutorial on the interactive links block useful. If you have any questions after watching this video, or comments or suggestions you'd like to make, please drop us a line in the comment section below. Also, make sure to subscribe to our channel and be the first to learn about any new tutorials and theme guides. Thank you for watching!